You know, I have a special scripture God gave me for you today. So put your hand on your heart because I want you to listen. Say, I promise. I will listen. Okay. And this is in Mark. And it's Mark 11. And guess what it is? Mark 11, 23. Whosoever shall say to this mountain, be thou removed and cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but believe the things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. So now I want you to put your hands up, because you're going to speak to your mountains. Why? Because you're going to get what's on the other side. Right? Okay, say, Father, in the name of Jesus, I speak to this mountain that is obstructing me from what I need to have. I thank you, Father, that today, today, I get what's on the other side. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, today, I'm very excited about this message. Why? Because it will change your life. I like this about God. He always wants to give you dramatic changes that are good. So put your hand on your heart. Say, I'm getting a dramatic change that is good. So you have your notes, and so we're going to go through five points. But I just want to tell you something funny. In 1983, I went to Ethiopia. And at that time, they were under communism, but they allowed them to have a church service. So I went to the church. Now, uh, they're like Orthodox. You know, they have a pope. So there are five Orthodox groups in the world. So they are one of them. So the men sit on one side and the women sit on the other side. Now, I don't know what's going on, but all these babies are crying and crying. So I said to the deacon who was sitting beside me, why are the babies crying? He said, because this is our fasting day and we're fasting our babies. Oh. I think, whatever. <laughs> you know. So I think lots of things go on that are kind of shocking of people and how they worship God. But I believe, you know, if, you, if that's your heart to have your baby fast and you can put up with the crying, okay, but don't make it too long. <laughs> So this morning, I want you to look at areas of your life. So I want you to take notes for yourself during this time that you have unbelief. You know, there are some things I have wanted and wanted to see God do, but I have doubted it. Have you? Have you? Have you? You're looking at me like I never had a doubt in my life. And I don't believe you. I think we've all had doubts. And so what do we do? And I'm really dealing with five of the basic doubts that can come your way and what to do with them. So number one is David had a wife who was a jerk. Say yuck twice. Yuck, yuck. You know, Michael got upset with him because she saw him dancing before the Lord. That's really bad news. And she despised him in her heart because she thought he wasn't sophisticated enough. So he never went with her again. He divorced her. And folks, sometimes, I looked at this, you have to divorce your unbelief. You know, there are some things that you think, well, yeah, God can do it, but I don't know if he'll do it for me. And so you have to say, okay, can God do all things? Can I believe God in these challenging times? Can I? And you say, no, I can't. Then you have to divorce your can'ts. So write in your notes, divorce my can'ts. Did you put it in? Now we're going to pray. Okay, ready? Say, Father, I believe... According to the Bible, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And so it's important for us to separate ourselves from those unbeliefs. Now, you say, 
how do you do that? And it's a shame that she didn't divorce herself from her unbelief because she never had any children. So unbelief keeps you in a negative place. And what was it? It was criticism. Did you ever criticize anybody? Don't, don't raise your hand. Because if you didn't, you're just absolutely lying. But criticizing others and how they did it and what they didn't do or how they dressed or how they treated their children or how they don't handle their money right, don't criticize because it does something to you. It caused her to lose her opportunity for a, a child, really. And that's big time. So bury your criticism of others. Who are you mad at today? Who are you criticizing today? I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. Just put your hand on your heart and pray and say, Father, that criticism I have of that person, whether it's right or wrong, I am bearing. I'm leaving it here at Encounter Church, and I'm not picking it up and taking it home. I'm not called to criticize. I'm called to change. Amen. Okay, now I want to talk about another D, and this is death. Because sometimes death can be a real hard thing for us. So here, David has a son. He and Bathsheba, and the child dies. And David is fasting during this time. Very disappointing. You know, everybody... Everyone here has had disappointments in prayer. You've had disappointments in circumstances. You've been disappointed at God sometime. And if you say you haven't, you're a liar. Because I've been disappointed at God sometimes. I thought he should do it faster and just do it. He hasn't even done it yet. You know what I'm saying? And so David had a son. And, you know, the son was very sick. And... David fasted and prayed. Now, he could have taken a lot of condemnation on himself because he had, this baby was born out of wedlock, and, but he didn't. He fasted and prayed and said, maybe, maybe the Lord will, you know, bring him back. I don't want him to die. I don't want him to die. So David stood in a place, you know, that I want this child to live. I want this child to live. And there are some things I have wanted I didn't get. And so then do you give up on God and wave God goodbye? No way. So what did he do? He's fasting and praying, and it doesn't happen. And he said, I can't bring him back to life, but someday I can go to him. He can't come back to me, but I can go to him. Do you look for the positive part of what God can do. So I find sometimes we carry grief because we don't like the way God did it. We wanted him to do such and such, and it didn't happen. So that can be a dangerous thing. So I'm going to share some family things. Uh, when my father died, and my father was hard to live with. He had mental problems. My mother didn't have a picnic with him. And, you know, he got all right, and then he died, and my mother went into grief, and she was grieving all the time, all the time. And I thought, why are you doing this? So one day I called her, and I felt like God gave me an answer. So you're getting an answer this morning. Put your hand on your heart. Say, I'm getting an answer to some issues of death this morning. So I called her one day, and I said, uh, Mother, uh, do you believe that Jesus carried your grief and sorrow? It says it. Yes, she said, I believe it. I said, then why are you carrying the grief of your husband? Because if Jesus carried it for you, what are you doing carrying it? And she cried and prayed, and that was the end of it. So, folks, you can carry grief. God didn't do it. didn't happen. I'm missing. You can carry it. But does the Bible say he carried your griefs? 
Does it? Does it? I'd like to hear you answer. I might keep asking you if you don't. So did he carry them? Are you going to carry them? Because grief can break you down. It can wound you no end. We know that. So I looked at this and I thought, David was smart. I can't, he can't come to me, but I can go to him. He chose the path of what God could do in this situation. And he could do a great miracle. Now, grief. Let's just talk about it. People say to me, well, grief is good for you. Well, it might be good for a little. But when people carry it and carry it, they quit going to church. They quit reading their Bible because they're mad at God and grieved at God. That's dangerous. So say this with me. Grief can be dangerous. We have to bury our grief and trust God's word. Now, I've had disappointments. Oh, God, I wanted this door to open. It didn't open. Where are you? You know, but you're going to have to leave some of these things with God and trust God. Everybody say it. Trust God. And my mother was a different person after that. And she lived very well until she died. Now, the third thing is disease. You know, the leper. Now, this is going to get really wild, but you already know I'm wild, don't you? I'm wild in faith. You know, I always will be. <laughs> and it said, a man with le leprosy came and knelt before Jesus. That's disease. Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. Immediately, he was cleansed of his leprosy. Does God want you to be whole? Yes. Now, he was cleansed of leprosy. Jesus said, I'm willing. So I think you have to stand on this, I am willing, and it may take a while. But I think wholeness here is bigger. Would you like to know what wholeness here is? Would you? Yes. Well, come next Sunday. No, no, you want to know today? Okay, put your hand on your heart. Say, I want to know today. Jesus said, be clean. I'm willing. Be clean. Immediately he was cleansed of the leprosy. Well, that's wonderful. He's cleaned up of it. He doesn't have it now. But I think also leprosy chewed off their fingers, their toes, parts of their body. I think Jesus restored what he had lost. I think he got some new fingers and some new toes. I bet he really looked good. Maybe he hadn't had a nose. But I think wholeness can be more than just getting rid of it. It can getting hold of what you lost. Do you like that? Well, would you please tell me? Yes! I wish you'd get a little excited. You know, I've just been in Bangladesh. They get excited. And honestly... They are Muslims, and they're different religions, and they get more excited than you. Good night. Okay. The leper, bear your unbelief. If it hasn't gotten healed yet, well, where is God? Where is he? And people get all nervous and backslide. That's so stupid. Everybody say stupid. You turn down what God can give you, and what about timing? I don't understand God's timing. I wish he'd get faster. And some things are fast, but some things you just think, God, where are you? I don't even know how to spell your name anymore. Watch those kind of things. You need to bury your unbelief that God is not willing to heal and just not give up. So let's do it. Say, Father, I bury unbelief. I thank you, Father that I am free from disappointment this morning. You called me here. You have a purpose. I'm not looking down. I'm looking up. Okay, the next one is disaster. Everybody say disaster. And that's kind of what we think we're in right now, is a disaster. 
So shall we fall apart, have a nervous breakdown? I don't think so. Suddenly, now, when we look at this, this is Paul and Barnabas in a prison. And what are they doing at midnight? Oh, where is God? I can't believe he deserted us. We're so good. We just preach the gospel, and then we get in trouble, and he looks the other way. Watch your behavior in disaster and help others when they are. So you have to bury your unbelief. And what did they begin to do? They began to praise God. Wow. And immediately, all the doors were open and everyone's chains were loosed. You realize it wasn't just their chains that were loosed. It was everybody. Your faith affects everybody. And what I see in my life is faith pleases God. So if I want to whine and murmur around, that doesn't please God. But if I want to believe and people think I'm crazy and relatives do and who, neighbors, hey, it's very important that I please God. Very important. And sometimes it takes a long time on some things to please God. And some things you don't understand, but you trust God anyway. Amen? Amen. Everybody say, trust God. Anyway, so bear your unbelief that God cannot bring your freedom, but despair. Oh, despair is a horrible thing. And I think about Absalom's sister. She was raped by her half-brother. You know, I'm sure you would want to kill them. Somebody hurting your sister? your half-sister, or hurting, oh, your family? That's a horrible, horrible thing. And you can live in bitterness. You can live in it. And this is a very serious thing. Now, I'm going to tell a family story. So I don't tell this every place, but I trust you. No, I don't trust you. <laughs> You'll tell it, and I want you to. But my mother became very bitter at my husband. She had loved him up to a certain point, but then she became bitter, and she did felt what we call feltograms for Sunday school. And as the Sunday school grew, you know, we got more books, more ways to present things, and she felt the only way was the, her feltogram. And so... She quit coming to church because she was mad at my husband for taking away the feltograms. Now, this is family. Everybody say family. So what am I doing? I'm telling a family secret because I want you to be helped by this. So my mother quit coming to church. And my husband went over and told her, you are wrong to leave church because you can't have your way with what you want. And at first, my mother was just ugly, and then she repented and came back to church. Now, that's a family story. Does anybody here have family stories? And probably some of you know mine. I don't know. You've been here a long time. But what are we going to do? Are we going to hold on to bitterness? Are we going to hold on to despair? You know, I don't, I don't believe we can hold on to bitterness this morning. And I sense a lot of you are being dealt with, with bitterness. It's just something that latches itself onto you, and suddenly you realize, oh, yeah, I am bitter about that. And you can be free. You can be free. Why hold on to it? Bitterness hurts you. So look at the person beside you on the right. Say, honey, bitterness hurts you. Now look at the person on the left. Say, bitterness hurts you. And so if you live in that bitterness, wow, you're going to hurt yourself. And you think you're hurting them, but the one you're hurting 
the most is that person. So I'm going to tell you a personal story, but you don't have to tell everybody. You probably will anyway. But, you know, we had a woman in our church that really said and did some ugly things to me. And so this is a long time ago, so don't try to guess who it is. The church is too old. I'm too old for you to guess. Plus, I don't want you to know. So I was very bitter at this one person in our church who had done some really ugly things. And one day the Lord dealt with me, and here's what he said to me. If you don't forgive her, how can I forgive you? Oh, that gets ugly. Oh, dear Lord. Well, she deserves it. He said, do you deserve to be forgiven? Well, I'm not talking about me. I'm talking about her. But I made a decision. And in order to keep that, I said it every day. Now, you're going to wonder about this for 20 days, because they say you make a habit or break a habit in 20 days. So I said, I forgive her. I forgive her. I forgive her for those days. And then one day she called me and said, uh, I'd like to take you to lunch and I'd like to tell you I'm sorry for the things I've said against you and done. And I said, I'll take the free lunch, but I don't remember what you did. <laughs> you know, folks, there comes a point when it can be buried and you don't have it. Amen. So I want you to pray now. Say, Father, I want to give up bitterness. I want to give up despair because I don't want to have bitterness destroy me. Because that bitterness destroyed really a brother and a sister involved. There was no answer to it. Why? Because if you don't bury it, how can I tell you this? It can bury you. I don't want to be buried. Amen? And we all can pull up family things especially. But, folks, we can't do that. That keeps us in despair. So I really want to pray some, do some serious praying right now. Are you ready? So put your hand on your heart. Say, Father. I don't want to be bitter. I don't want to think I deserve to be bitter. I want to be free. So I am repenting of any bitterness I have held toward anyone. And I believe, I believe that you are doing things in me this morning at Encounter Church. I'm going to leave here in freedom, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Could we just thank the Lord for that? God, we just thank you that we're not going to carry bitterness out of here. And what if it comes to your mind? What do you say? You didn't listen. What do you say if it comes to your mind? I've already repented. I've forgiven. I'm not under that. Right? You're so weak. Good night. We have donuts out there. And they, I had half of one this morning. Okay, put your hand on your heart. Say, Father, I want to repent of any bitterness I have carried toward anyone. I thank you that the sun sets free is free indeed. I am free from all bitterness in Jesus' name. And I stay free because I remember this morning. I remember. I remember. I chose to forgive, to bury that unforgiveness. Amen. Now, the last one fits everybody. 
So I'm going to count to three, and I want you to read it. You say, you always make us pay attention. I know it. I used to be a school teacher. This is B under five. I'm going to count to three, and I want you to read it. One, two, three. Bury thoughts that tell you God does not care about your future. I think that's one of the worst things of all. Well, look at what's happening in the world. He doesn't care about my future. Or look at where I have failed. He doesn't have future for me. Folks, God has good future for us. And we need not to go there with that. And I think with all the news that we see, we can really think negative, can't we? I'm not going to think negative. Now, you saw me kind of limp up here, right, and sit down. But this week, I'm going for stem cells. So next week, I'll be running. <laughs> Folks, you can say, well, you're 79. You're too old to run. Oh, shut up. I, I don't believe we're ever too old for faith and faith in God. And I don't think we're, we can ever give up on our children and on our circumstances. I'm seeing some things in Michael's family that amaze me. But I can tell you that's been a long haul. Long haul. And when we were in our building over on Platte River Drive, he broke into the building and stole things, and it got on the front page of the paper, Pastor, son of Happy Church, breaks into building and steals and is now in jail. Well, isn't that good advertising? Oh, wouldn't you love to go to that church? But did you notice we're still here? Why? Because we don't give up. We believe that God will take care of our future and that it isn't over till we win. And I have some things on my heart I'm telling you that I'm going to get to do. You say you're 89. So what? I'm not 100. So just shut up and let me walk in faith. No, I don't. Forgive me for saying shut up. <laughs> Please. Forgive me, Reese, for saying shut up. Now, maybe this morning you need to bury some things. Maybe you've never received Jesus as your Savior. I was 16, 89, never been sorry, had a miraculous life, and on the way to heaven. Maybe you say, well, I can't name a time when I invited him into my heart. Or maybe you say, yeah, I have, but I'm, I'm, not, I'm a sloppy Christian. I want to really recommit my life to Jesus Christ. I want to recommit my life. Who knows what good he has prepared for you. So if this names you, I'm not sure I have Jesus in my heart, or I just need to recommit. Would you put your hand up real high? I want to recommit. Wonderful. I believe people are getting free of things this morning. And this is so wonderful. So I'm going to ask us all to pray. Are you ready? You say, well, I don't need to. Well, it's not going to hurt you. Do it anyway and help the people around you. We want to help each other, right? Say, Father, I know that you love me. I'm not an accident. I'm a divine appointment. The Bible says, if I repent of my sins and call on your name, I will be saved. I am sorry for all the trash in my life. And I repent of turning my back on you in circumstances. I repent of not bearing what the devil tries to bring up and leave it alone 
Jesus, I believe you are the Savior of the world. But I believe that you are my Savior also. So this morning, I proclaim you are my Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, I'm going to ask you to get bold, okay? If you prayed that prayer for the first time, or you recommitted your life, would you raise your hand? If you prayed that for the first time, or you recommitted your life, I'm just looking around. Do I see anybody? Okay, I see that hand. Okay, I want everyone who raised your hand I need to see you better. As you can tell, I'm wearing glasses. Would you please stand up? You raised your hand. Stand up. Just stand up. That's good. That's good. Now, all of you seated, if you think I'm through with you, I'm not. Turn to the one on the right. Say, do you need to stand up? I'd like to stand with you, even if you know what they'll say. Turn to the left. Say, do you need to stand up? I'd like to stand with you. And then just stand with that person. That's good. Now, I want everyone who is standing to come right up here to the front, and I get to pray with you. So just come up here. That's good. And if you need to come and you didn't stand up or raise your hand, come up. Join us, please. That would be absolutely wonderful. And I, I'm going to give an admonition to the rest of you. You know, uh, I went to get my hair cut the other day, and Barbara went with me. Uh, she took me. And so she witnessed to the receptionist. Receptionist, not a Christian, and prayed the sinner's prayer and is coming to the next service. Now, folks, I don't know if you get a greater joy than this. Amen? Amen? So everyone extend your hands. Say, pray with her. Say, Father, Father you, love me. you love me. You sent your son, you sent your son to, die to die for my sins. I thank you, I thank you that I can have forgiveness. Can have forgiveness. All, my All my past can be buried. Can be buried. I thank you, Jesus for coming into my heart, for being my Lord and Savior, in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Thank the Lord.